Sometimes after certain things happen, you can never be the same again. There is a term that you will learn or that you will hear a lot in junior English, and it is disillusionment. Disillusionment. Now, if you are illusioned about something, do you believe that, or do you, is your idea the truth? No. But is your idea better than the truth or worse than the truth? Better. Better. So, for instance, um, we are in the process of, of planning a Cinco de Micah, which is going to be Micah's fifth birthday party. I think it's awesome. Is that in any way offensive? No. Is that, I know, I asked the laundry man, I'm like, okay, is this offensive? Because I think that's the best birthday title ever. And he's also obsessed with Mexican food and stuff. Yeah. So we're planning our Cinco de Micah, right? And so he started telling me all these things that are going to happen at his birthday party. And I'm like, okay, first of all, this is not MTV, my sweet 16. <laughs> and I'm like, your expectations and my expectations are definitely on two different planes and in two different pocketbooks. And so a lot of times we expect things to be a certain way. We, we picture it with such grandeur that it can never live up to those things. And there are moments in life when things pop our bubble. And after that bubble has popped, after our vision of how life is, after something kind of takes away a piece of our innocence, if you will, we can't go back to that point. We can't unsee that. I think about my friend Jared that found two people that he had known all of his life. You know, that were bloodied and gored and beaten from this accident. How he felt like he could never go back to the moment before. He'll never talk about their names without picturing, you know, those things. And so these soldiers who went to World War I and saw some really horrible stuff, some of that never goes away. You figure out ways to cope with it, to push it back, to do these things, but some of it never goes away. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the year will be towards the end of the semester when we bring in, if Ron gets to come for us again, my Vietnam vet speaker. And he'll speak about Vietnam. He actually says it's become therapy for him. But there are some things about Vietnam that we will talk about before he comes and we'll say, we don't talk about this, 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 and this. And he just, he doesn't because he can't go into those doors. Because it takes him back to a place that he was not happy when he left. And so when you're disillusioned, you only see it as horrible and bad. Life is horrible. Everything's horrible. So the glass is always half empty. <clears throat> when you're illusioned, everything is great. It kind of makes me think of middle school love. You know how middle school love where that person is absolutely perfect until two days later when you break up and they're the worst person <laughs> on the face of the planet, like you're convinced. You know, they assassinated Kennedy and all this kind of stuff, right? So you go from being totally illusioned to being totally disillusioned. So after World War I, a lot of people are disillusioned, and so they want to leave where they are. They leave that small town, and more people start to move to the cities. Now, what's great about cities? There's more to do. Somehow, it's easier to get lost in a crowd of people. You know, you would think out in the middle of nowhere it's easier to get lost, but no, the 25 people who know where you are, they know where you are. It's easier to get lost. And with this, we start to kind of have two different <laughs> ideas develop. Now, I want to stress this by saying this really has nothing to do with politics, okay, in this form. <laughs> Conservatism versus liberalism. Sorry, and again, we're not talking about Democrats or Republicans. So conservatism, is that the city or the country? The country, the country is conservative. The country is the old ways. Liberalism, city, and the new ways. And so we see both conservatives and liberals, and again, don't think politics here. Young people. City. Which category? Conservatives or liberals? Mm -hmm. Typically liberals. And again, we're not talking about politics. Old people. Science and religion, which one goes where? Which group supports prohibition? 
The abstain or the getting rid of alcohol. Some of both, surprisingly. There are certain reforms that you see go across both categories. I know that's kind of a, a spoiler there after you know, how this has all worked. But so you get the idea. Old ideas, new ideas. And so people move to the city for new ideas. There are also inventions that began to come into play that make daily life easier. You know, my favorite gift that I have given to myself in a really long time was purchasing a Roomba. Ah, vacuuming is now my favorite chore of the day. It's like, <laughs> boop, and I hit it on my phone, and Mr. Poonie Pants does his job. That's what my connected is. <laughs> so Mr. Poonie Pants does his job. We're good to go. I'm trying to get the, I want to get some big bubbly eyes for him. My name is one of them. Yeah. So what you see here with this, why does this matter for our purposes? Well, um, things like washing machines. Now, don't think about like a modern day washing machine, but it's actually a hand crank thing versus where you were outside with a bucket and soap for hours. Things get easier. <clears throat> they come up with new things that make it easier to do household chores. So women, particularly women who like lived in the city, they didn't need as many hours as they needed previously to do these things. So they begin to have more time on their hands. Time on their hands means you have time to get more things done that you want to do. What you also see is we talked about people leaving the farm. Country folks want city things. Now, this is a little hard for your generation to understand, and I don't mean this condescending at all. You have the Internet. So living in Pascagoula, even like gift shops, you know, if uh, like if you forget something at a gift shop, you're visiting somewhere and you're like, oh my goodness, I wanted to get this and this. You can go online to most gift shops at wherever and order that item and have it sent to your house. You know, it just kind of takes the, in fact, a couple of times, if there was something kind of expensive I wanted in a gift shop at different places, I've gone online and found where they had like an online sale that they didn't have in the store. And so I'm like, I'll just get that shipped to the house, free shipping, there we go. Good times. However, years ago, way before any of us, uh, you didn't have these things. You didn't have, you know, ways that you could do that. And so what they would do is they would, there was this new thing called the Sears and Roebuck catalog. You've heard of Sears, but you haven't heard of Roebuck. So it used to be Sears and Roebuck. And the Sears catalog would arrive at your house and it would tell you all those things that you might want. And you could go through it, and you could pick them out. And you, as a lady or gentleman living all the way away from these big cities, could have that same item delivered to your door. Granted, it wasn't Amazon two-day prime shipping. <laughs> it might be weeks, but you would get those same inventions. These new vacuum cleaners that had developed in the cities. It was a new thing. You didn't have to take your rugs out and beat them for hours and shake them to get all that stuff off. You could just run that vacuum cleaner. Do people not put their furniture on top of the rugs? Um, the big, huge rugs, most people didn't have the big, huge rugs because those were very expensive then. But some would not for that reason. Because you wouldn't put like a table or a yeah. sofa that, yeah, you know, weighs 500 pounds or something. Those lighter pieces for sure. All right. So we do begin to see this growth of the cities. And the cities provide so many advantages, for sure. So let's talk about prohibition. Prohibition. All right, so prohibition goes into effect in 1920. There's a show that I really liked um, when it came, first came out. It's a HBO. HBO does a lot of historical type stuff with some of their miniseries and things like that. And this one was called Boardwalk Empire. It's about a gangster in Atlantic City by the name of Nucky Thompson and the things that he did legally and illegally to make tons and tons of money. So in that show, it particularly featured one guy that we're going to spend a lot of detail on, and that's Al Capone. So Al Capone and others like him would illegally smuggle liquor. They would either buy it from people who were bootleggers making it illegally, or buy it from bootleggers who were bringing it from Canada or from Mexico or from the Caribbean. A lot of people would make it outside of the U.S. Fun fact about Al Capone. When I first came to Pascagoula 
and talked about this. I had students who would say, you know, Al Capone had a house in Ocean Springs. And I was like, okay, that's cool, because, I mean, you know, that makes total sense, right? And so not long after that, I did a little asking just because more than one student said that. And sure enough, there has been this long-term rumor about this Al Capone house. Now, I'm going to show you the house in Ocean Springs that is believed to, if nothing else, they know Capone has visited there, but it's believed that he possibly had his liquor shipped there. Because think about it. You ship your liquor to Miami, which is a huge port where everybody's expecting it, or you go to some little tiny port in the middle of nowhere, which one's smarter? And so let's just say that if this was Al Capone's house, he definitely wasn't living in an upstairs apartment, you know. And so this is the house today. You could buy this house in Ocean Springs that at one time is believed to have been inhabited by Capone. Elvis Presley has been there before. Some other big names. Uh, just all of this is like built in. It's really beautiful looking at the pictures. Uh, it's only $5 million. <laughs> So if you're looking for like, I mean, I know it's a little close for like a vacation home. This part's really cool because these are all hidden. They're like hidden inside the wood. Wow. So, of course, you know, smuggling liquor and whatnot. I doubt they would smuggle liquor into wine baths like that because they would have smuggled it in small containers. They've done it in big containers. So I'm sure it's just for the nostalgia and the rumored connection, but still. And obviously the very frugal pool that they put outside. Yeah, the outdoor uh, fireplace there is pretty fantastic. Oh, I'm sorry, it's kitchen, not the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, Al Capone needed. I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, in case you just need to cook out those. So anyway, if you're looking for, if you're looking for a new residence, you know, and you want to move to Ocean Springs, there's your property. All right, so I was going to show you this. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but uh, this kind of popped up. I got to... This popped up, and I think this kind of got overlooked after Hurricane Katrina because June 13th, this was about six weeks before Hurricane Katrina. So there's this guy fishing in Ocean Springs, kind of close to where the Capone house is, back on one of the bayous. And while he's there, he snags something. You can tell it's kind of heavy, doesn't know what it is, and it tells you the story that he had heard there was good fishing here. And so he says he tried casting for trout, in Davis Bay, and instead of fish, he caught a lucky snag instead. And when I started up with it, it was kind of heavy, you know? And when I got it up, there was a lump of mud, and I could tell it was a wallet. And I got really excited, and I opened it up and could see the coins inside, and I knew I had something that I could explain. Five coins dated from 1899 to 1917 provide the monetary treasure. So, I mean, the coins would have some value, but that kind of helps you date that, too. But the leather wallet is the shocker. Puckett cleaned off the mud to reveal the name Al Capone. And that was when I saw Al Capone for the first time. You can imagine it just shocked me. He said, shock gave way to nervousness, fear, and paranoia. I got scared. You know, I was wondering if I could keep this thing. Who do I tell? What do I do? He's contacted several antique experts to determine if the wallet really belonged to Chicago's most infamous gangster. If Michael Puckett's discovery could be authenticated, it would be it would lend credence to a long-term legend in Ocean Springs. Many residents have heard the stories that a nearby house in the bay was a favorite hangout for Capone, as the gangster was overseeing shipments of bootleg whiskey to America. Uh, the home is just a fishing castaway from the spot where Puckett snagged his treasure. Authentic or not, it'll always make for a good fishing story. I had an unfortunate cast, but I snagged it and pulled something out of the water. It's pretty amazing. Puckett has no plans of selling the wallet. Now, it says updated, but I can't find anything different from probably the three or four years that I pulled up the story. So, I don't know what they have updated. And, you know, I'm sure if he found this in 2015, I'm sure by now he has some sort of idea if they believe it to have any authenticity. But I've looked on the Internet. I can't find anything else about it. But at least it gives you the idea that, you know, that kind of gives validity to the story. Kind of gives validity to the story. The date of the coins, the condition of the wallet. Um, so, anyway, interestingly enough, I just thought so. I think it's kind of neat. So, let's talk a little bit about the gangsters like Capone. There were lots of gangsters during this era. Lots of different gangsters. Lots of people that were running liquor. Not all of them were big time like Capone. You had some that would run liquor on a small scale. 
Because anytime something becomes illegal, it becomes two things, expensive and valuable. The more, you know, with something being illegal, it becomes in shortage, it's harder to get, and that makes it more valuable, it's supply and demand. And before it had been illegal, liquor had been legal ever since, you know, we were formed. I mean, we brought over whiskey, we brought over fire water to the natives and guns. And so when you make something illegal that was once legal, that is a very hard, hard sell. Uh, Capone is really one of the ones I find the most interesting. When I was in the uh, penitentiary in Philadelphia a couple days ago, there is a cell there that he was arrested in for a short time. And there's actually speculation if the rest was legitimate or if he was trying to hide out. Because at the time, he was in a little bit of trouble. Not with the law, because the law had a hard time catching him. But he was in trouble with uh, some other people because of some things he had he was involved with. One of the best stories about Capone uh, is definitely the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And so the picture on the right is Valentine's Day gone really, really wrong. So if you think you've had bad Valentine's Days, just remember, it could be worse. So here's what takes place. Capone is one of the big mob bosses in Chicago, but he's not the only big mob boss. And so everybody wants to kind of be the winner here, right? You want to be a bigger boss than the other bosses. So, basically, they all agreed to have a meeting and have dinner. And the agreement was nobody would bring guns. And one of Capone's guys, they had snuck guns back into the uh, bathrooms. Had them hidden in the bathrooms. And they go back into the bathroom and they come out with uh, Tommy guns, basically, and they kill the other guys. And the other big bosses. So, I mean, you know, that's one way to get rid of the opposition. Uh, but this is actual crime scene photos showing that. So Capone himself was, he was big time. One of his issues, though, is he he kept his men in absolute fear, and so people did not want to tell him. Uh, there's a scene in Boardwalk Empire, and I've tried to kind of research this, and it's believed to be pretty accurate, but there's this one scene where this 14-year-old boy who worked for Capone said something that he shouldn't have said in front of somebody he shouldn't have said it to, but the guy didn't catch it. The guy didn't catch the mistake, you know. And so Capone's sitting there talking to him, and one of the guys is like, well, you're sure lucky, Jimmy, that, you know, nothing came out of that, and, you know, and, but here's the thing, if one person makes a mistake and you let them buy with it, then it becomes a commonplace. And so Capone, you know, they're like, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like he did it on purpose, you know, nothing happened. So Capone walks over, takes his gun, shoots him between the eyes and kills him. Because he makes a statement. He's going to do that over a little mistake. What's he going to do on you writing him out? And so a lot of these guys, they it's easy to glorify them as kind of this gangster age, but it was uh, it was a it was not a easy age. He didn't mind killing people. And in that same scene, he goes in, he washes his hands, he gets in his car, and he comes home and he sits down and he eats dinner with his family, and he puts his deaf son to bed. And watching this guy who just like blew his kid's head off, like sitting there with his son signing to it, you're like, that's messed up. So, but anyway, but these guys created extreme fear. So how do you catch somebody like this? Well, you go through their bank records. You see, Capone doesn't end up in prison for the rest of his life because of the illegal things that he's done with running drugs and alcohol. He also uh, he went from liquor to heroin. He was doing or running both towards the end. Uh, also, they ran some prostitution houses and other things, but really the big thing is the prohibition. How does he end up in jail? They try to figure out a way to catch him, and they finally do through a new law called the Graduated Income Tax. And so they managed to subpoena his bank records. And in his bank records, he is depositing tons more money than he is claiming on his taxes. Like, a whole lot more, hundreds of times more. If I'm not mistaken, he had like a flower shop that was like a front for his, for a lot of their operations, and they claimed taxes from that, but nowhere near all the money he's depositing in his bank account. So Capone ends up in prison. I uh, did spend, a, he spent like a few months at the penitentiary there in uh, Philadelphia, but his biggest prison sentence or the rest of his life where he ends up is in Alcatraz, uh, Alcatraz Island, and he dies there. 
So that is the story of, of Al Capone. All right. So with Al Capone, he's, like I said, not the only one running liquor, but he's just a great example. So let's talk about the Scopes trial. The Scopes trial. John Scopes. Is a biology teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, and he teaches the theory of evolution in his classroom. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah, no, I happen to be there at the right time. There you go. I'll take it. All right. In um, Dayton, Tennessee, and they're going to get rid of my stroke live screen. All right, uh, so here's what happens. There is a law in Tennessee at the time called the Butler Law. Bless you. Bless you. You're good. You need some tissue? The Butler Law. And the Butler Law said you could not teach the development of man in any other way other than through creationism. God created the earth in seven days, those kind of things. The Genesis uh, story. And so Scopes is said to have opened up a biology book and to have taught Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest and evolution and all this. And so the Scopes trial is a trial that shows the conflict, and here's where this comes in, between science and religion and education. Between science and religion and education. It is a media circus. Uh, this is actually turned into a play called the, um, no, not the Crucible. Oh, Inherit the Wind is the name of it. Crucible is a different one. Uh, so it's turned into a play called Inherit the Wind. And what Inherit the Wind is basically just, it becomes the definition of the scope trial. But it does turn into a media circus. His attorney, Clarence Darrow, was a Yankee uh, lawyer who defended him. And he was hired by the ACLU to come down and to protect him. Now, here's what makes this interesting. In the end, he is charged because they never showed that he didn't teach evolution. But instead, Darrow fought the fact that Realistically, teachers should be allowed to teach the newest ideas of science and other things. Now, steps is fine was like, I want to say $100. It was, which was more then than it is now, but still. That was the minimal thing they could give him. They gave him no prison. They gave him none of that. So let me tell you what really happened with the scope trial. That's the part you have to know for testing and all of that. But there is, that is actually one of the things textbooks print that is kind of a mistelling of the truth. John Scopes was actually not a biology teacher. He taught PE. And um, he was a member of the ACLU. He was from Ohio, but he worked in Tennessee. And they were trying to test the Tennessee Butler Act because they had teachers who wanted to teach these other scientific theories, but legally could not. Because if you did, then that would be breaking the law. And so they asked Scopes if he was okay with the fact he didn't want to live in Tennessee a long time anyway, if he was okay with there being a rumor started that he taught this so that they could have charges brought against him. And that way, if he was convicted with a severe sentence, they could come back on appeal and he could testify that he was a PE teacher and that he was never there. And so it's really a testing of the law thing, kind of like how the Plessy versus Ferguson was. And so I actually, I was, I have been taught all of, my educational career that you know, Scopes taught evolution. He really didn't. He taught PE. Uh, there was a book, All God's Dangers, that I had to read in graduate school. It was just kind of fascinating to me. But why this matters is it brings this into the forefront with how religion and science mesh or don't mesh. Before this time, you don't really see as much conflict between these two ideas. And people had ideas with how they could coexist. But after this, you begin to see this, this chism, if you will, that develops between the two. All right. So switching gears a little bit. I always love when things like the way we tell things aren't the way they really are. Yeah. And it says that, like, because we're learning about evolution right now. Yeah. And she said that, like, even now, certain teachers or certain teachers are not trying to find the culture. Like, even by, like, the Board of Education in Mississippi, like, that they won't even state the word evolution and like that. Like when it's in there, they don't say it as evolution. They write it as like uh, what's the other term for it? It's like not as like or not as like evolution. They give it basically they like 
in it certain is. school districts, or I think it's like all like in Pacific. Really, I need to ask her about that. That's yeah, and she said something like that, and she said that it's because of you know the past, and because and, you know also because we're in that Bible Belt, and mm -hmm. just like you know religion means a lot to people. Like, it'll really not like that kind of like, See, I, I was taught that though. I I was taught in public school, and we we learned about the theory. Yeah, I mean they teach you evolution. It's just like what are you like what how it's how it's called. Yeah. yeah. Like, I understand what you're saying. That's just interesting to me that, of course, you know, Mississippi isn't always notorious for being the most forward thinking state. So, it is what it is. I'll have to ask her about that. All right, flappers. How many of you have heard of flappers before? Maybe it's kind of, okay. So, flappers are 20s women. Now, let me stop myself. Flappers are young 20s women in the city who are unmarried. You see how it's a subgroup and a subgroup and a subgroup? Why are they young 20s women in the city who are unmarried? Well, for one thing, this is a modern movement. That's not going to happen out in the middle of the countryside. You didn't have, like, the flappers of George County, okay? You know, this was like a small little group of ladies. They were city girls. If you've ever seen the movie Chicago, I always kind of think about that. Uh, one of my favorite films from this time period is a, it's an old Brad Pitt film. It's A River Runs Through It. And you've probably never heard of it. It came out in like 92. But it kind of shows that conflict between modern and all that. So anyway, a little bit about a flapper. She voted. She was free with these new inventions from the drudgery of housework. She might have a job. Now, she wasn't a poor girl because poor girls were at work. But she might have a job, you know, a kind of fun job she could go to. Work. So she had her own money. She might even have an education. And flappers make a lot more sense when you've read The Great Gatsby, too. That's one of those places I always hate that you haven't had that experience. Flappers uh, might ride in closed-in cars with men. Heck, they might even drive. I know. Crazy stuff. They would wear higher hemlines. So where at this era, a typical woman... Your ordinary woman, her hemline would come to, yeah, okay. So these ladies, notice their dresses, they're above their ankles, they come to about the bottom of their calf, and then you see the flapper, hers comes right at the knee, or a little above the knee. And what these girls would do is they would take blush, they would take rouge, and they would put it on their knees so that you could, to make sure that you could see, hey, you can see my knee. It was like, like arrows, like here's my knees, you know. Uh, the blush thing I learned not all that long ago, and I just thought that was kind of funny. Like, wait a minute, I've got to get my makeup on, you know, and stuff. Yeah, good times. <laughs> Contour my knees a little bit. All right, some other things. Uh, their fabric was rayon and nylon, and why that matters is their clothes were more form-fitting. So you could see a female form more. Uh, they would wear makeup, especially, like, eyeliner and bright lipstick. She might even smoke in public with men. She didn't vape then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. She didn't vape. Back when you're walking through wood. Why does that smell like bad cotton candy? <laughs> uh, she might use frank language. Now, what we mean by frank language, I'm not talking about like profanity, but it kind of ladies were expected to be very vague. And you weren't expected to state your opinion as much and you know be sweet. And, and so she just might say what she's thinking very frankly say what she was thinking and that was not traditional for that time period. What's the main character of Roxy? Uh Roxy. Yeah. Yeah. Roxy Hart. <laughs> she might <laughs> just like Roxy Hart. She might even get a divorce. Scandalous. And she had no sense of responsibility really. And Roxy Hart is so perfect for that because even though she was married, she just she was like a child in a lot of Yes. Ways, you know and just the immaturity. She was like a spoiled child. All right. Uh, again, these are city ladies. Uh, and you can see this is reflected even like in the movies and these things. You know, you see these more sexualized women. Uh, they begin to have gender-based magazines like Cosmopolitan and Ladies Home Journal. Uh, and so it's, it's magazines based towards your sex where I try to be careful not to say sex magazines because you think like pornography is on talking about but it would be like magazines based towards sex so it would be based towards women and women's interests where most magazines before were based towards men because most of your educated readers were men all 
All right, so we begin to see changes in the family life. Divorce becomes more common. The car actually brings separation. So think about that. Uh, some of you are old enough now that you can drive. Some of you have the means to drive as well. And when you can drive yourself, when you have that ability to drive yourself, what you find is, you know, you can make some choices. Now, granted, if you make some wrong ones, you may not have that ability to drive yourself for very long. But I remember one of the first times I was driving somewhere without my parents and uh, and just thinking, I'm going to go this way. You know, and it was just the fact that I could. I'm like, I'm going to go. We never go this direction, so I'm going to take this way to get to Grandma's house, you know. And there was the wolf. Anyway, but I said, and there was the wolf. So, yeah, on the way to Grandma's house. Anyway, so with the car, the car does bring more separation because before if you lived out on the farm and people got mad, you, like, walked out to the barn. You know, and with the car, you could, like, go out and be like, well, I'm leaving Loosedale for a little while, Margaret, you know. And so that's it. But it does. It gives you mobility. And it gives you that, you know. And so this kind of does start to hurt, I think, that central family unit. And that is why we do see an increase, I believe, that starts in divorce here. Um, church is still the major center for most U.S. families. It really is kind of that, that major part of their life. So tomorrow we are going to pick up talking about entertainment, the movies, and the radio. Um, love the 20s. Lots of fun stuff tomorrow, actually. Tomorrow will be a good day. We're going to talk about sports and literature and the oh, renaissance. <laughs> Is it on Spotify or it's on Spotify and it's usually like if it can stay on but it's it's free not changed from like all of like all month January. If you save one season and not change, that's great. Sign up my mom's house, my bedding and my husband, so I can have some.